old-fashioned murder and mayhem, fire, blood, and water, the Frank McDowell story, 1923-1924. It was shortly after midnight, February 19, 1923. John M. McDowell was jarred awake by a thunderous crash. Leaping to his feet, he raced into the hallway where he found his 18-year-old son, Frank, standing at the door to the room where his two sisters slept. Help me, Father, Frank shouted frantically. I can't get the door to open. Mr. McDowell could smell the smoke from the raging inferno behind the door. Get your mother and get out of the house, he commanded. Frank quickly obeyed. Desperately, John tried to wrest the door open, but to no avail. It was stuck. The next thing he knew, someone was pulling him out of the house. A nearby neighbor, Mr. McWhorter, returning home after midnight and seeing the billowing flames pouring from the back room, called for help. Other neighbors were awakened by the commotion and gathered to try to comfort Rose McDowell, who was hysterical with grief. Two men returned inside and managed to force the door open, but it was too late. The entire room seemed to be a lake of fire. Later, the charred remains of Marion and Willa T. McDowell, 17 and 15, were found on the floor only inches from the door. They had tried valiantly to escape. The fire had been confined to the girls' room, but it had been so hot that it caused the rafters to collapse. The surviving McDowell family had only been able to make it out of the house in their night clothes. John McDowell's bare feet were severely blistered from the intense heat. Obviously, someone had thrown an incendiary into the house but who would want to hurt two sweet teenage girls in such a horrific manner? Welcome to the True Crime Podcast, Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson. This podcast brings you historical stories of murders and scandals that occurred in small towns throughout America. By combining the resources and methods used in genealogy research, I piece together the details of the lives and circumstances of notorious events that touch the lives of our ancestors. The aim of this podcast is to examine the background, documents, newspaper accounts, and cultural influences surrounding the events. It is not my purpose to sensationalize or shame the subjects or their families. All families have skeletons in the closet. But to look at the lives of real people and see how circumstances of nature and nurture, as well as how world events affected the lives of the people involved in the stories. I have spent over 50 years interested in genealogy research and recently retired as head of genealogy at the Jefferson County Library in Missouri. During my tenure, I began a podcast entitled Murder and Mayhem in Jefferson County, Missouri, which gained popularity. Upon my retirement, I decided to continue and expand the podcast with similar stories found in small towns across the United States. Join me now as we explore tales of old-fashioned murder and mayhem. John Macon McDowell born in 1871, came from an old and prominent lineage of ancient southern families. Among his ancestors were surnames such as McDade, Proctor, Maxey, and Bloodworth. In October 1903, he married Rosa Cloud Putnam, granddaughter of the noted Georgia Baptist minister, Reverend Joshua Sanford Calloway, Sr., McDowell worked in real estate, but made his professional mark as a newspaper editor for the Ackworth Post and later the DeKalb New Era. The marriage produced three children, Frank P., 1904, Marion, 1905, and Willa T., 1908. All three were attractive, intelligent children who were the pride of their parents. 
about 1921, the McDowell family moved to Decatur, Georgia, into a modest frame house on Ponce de Leon Street. The house had six spacious rooms with a large covered front porch. The children attended Decatur High School, where Marion was set to graduate in June 1923. But that dream was not to be. The fire that raged that February night had been confined only to the girls' room. There was a distinct smell of gasoline that permeated the room. This had been an act of murder. The surviving McDowell family was taken in by John's sister and brother-in-law, P.C. Carnes, who had arrived at the smoldering house in time to help remove the unrecognizable bodies of his nieces. Rumors and speculation began to circulate immediately about who could possibly have committed such an atrocious act. The theory that enemies might have been made by Mr. McDowell's newspaper was brought up as a possibility, but was soon dismissed. Mrs. McDowell remarked that she had fired her cook, Mrs. Nix, two days before. Perhaps the woman sought revenge over that. It was 1920s Georgia, and Dimpy Nix was an African-American woman. The idea that a black woman had set fire to the home of her white ex-employer, causing the death of two white girls, sent up a deadly alarm of outrage among the Decatur citizens. Authorities rushed to the home of Nix's sister, Winnie White, where Mrs. Nix was living, to bring her in for questioning. One can only imagine the terror the woman felt. There was evidence that the fire had been started by an incendiary that had been thrown into the room as no sign of the fire starting under the house was found. By late in the evening, after intense grilling by the police, Dimpy confessed. She said she had told her husband, Johnny Nix, that she had been fired from her job as cook because Mrs. McDowell believed she'd stolen things from the house. Dimpy said he was furious and had promised to, quote, get the McDowells and make a big blowout of it, end quote. Her confession went on to say that Johnny Nix had solicited the help of his brother, Bud. She claimed that she didn't know what he planned to do, but later he told her the house had burned up and two of the girls burned up with it. She said he told her, quote, he had done the job and done it well, end quote. With that, Johnny Nix, his brother Bud, and sister-in-law Esther Nix were also arrested and held. When the confession hit the newspapers, a mob began gathering to attack and kill the prisoners. The hysteria was so great, they were taken to Atlanta to be held for their own safety. On the following day, Dimpy repudiated her confession, saying she had been coerced by the police into giving it. It is unlikely that anyone would have taken the trouble to listen, except for the fact that John McDowell's brother-in-law, P.C. Carnes, spoke with Sheriff McClurdy, voicing strong doubts that the fire had been started by the Nixes. He believed the trouble lay much closer to home. Whatever he said caused the charges to suddenly be dropped against all four suspects. Due to an overwhelming odor of accelerant in the room, it appeared the fire had been an inside job. Suspicion fell on the eldest son, Frank McDowell. However, when the detectives came to question him, Mrs. McDowell sent them away in outrage. Unable to piece their lives back together in Decatur after the trauma, the McDowells moved to Clearwater, Florida to start over. John McDowell sold his newspaper business and started working in real estate. Rose McDowell sold advertisement space for the local newspaper. Frank tried his hand at various occupations, but he did not like work and either quit or was fired from each endeavor. Although Frank's parents were frustrated with him, they tried to be patient, realizing that he was likely having great difficulty dealing with the family tragedy. 
As the first anniversary of the fire approached, Rose McDowell fell into a depression. Her 82-year-old widowed mother, Della Calloway Putnam, had come to stay with the family to recover from an illness and to give some comfort to her daughter. Rose spent the day writing letters to friends and relatives, describing the effort the family was making to move forward, but she made it clear that her heart found little joy since the loss of her daughters. The stack of letters was set aside to be mailed later. Emotionally exhausted, the McDowell family went to bed early. That evening, February 19, 1924, a heavy rainstorm passed through Clearwater, Florida. Lightning and thunder and heavy downpours muffled the sound of the incredible events unfolding at the McDowell's home. Around 1 p.m., W.L. Stone, a neighbor who lived across the road, was awakened by the howls of young Frank McDowell crying out for help. Please call a doctor, the youth pleaded. Someone has shot Papa. Stone peered outside to see a white figure disappear into the McDowell house. He quickly dressed and made his way across the street. When he entered the house, he found Frank kneeling beside the bed, rocking back and forth and crying as if his heart would break. On the bed were his parents, John and Rose. They had been shot in the head. Mr. Stone noticed a paper wadded into the mouth of John McDowell and thought this must have been a murder-suicide. He quickly ushered the boy out of the room to spare him any more shock. Between sobs, Frank revealed that it was the one-year anniversary of the tragedy that took his sisters. Why couldn't they have left me at least one, he wailed. When the police arrived, Frank said that he had been sleeping in the family room because his grandmother was staying in his room. Because she was profoundly deaf, she had slept through the commotion. During the storm, Frank had awakened to the sound of the gun firing. He got up to investigate and was hit in the head, rendering him unconscious. When he came to, he realized there had been a shooting and ran to get help. As unlikely as the chances were that two unimaginable tragedies could strike the same family exactly one year apart, it might have been plausible, except for the bizarre note found shoved into John McDowell's mouth. When Warren L. Stone removed it, he saw a heart-shaped typed letter stained with blood. When he handed the missive over to the police, they took Frank to the station for questioning. They woke Mrs. Putnam and arranged for the extremely distraught old woman to be transferred into the care of her son-in-law and with the recitation of the Lord's Prayer. But then it continued with the following, quote, O Jehovah, for thrust in the defiled womb of the elder virgin of the issue of Antichrist, didst I offer up this prayer to the Spirit, writ upon the likeness of the cross of sin, which didst weigh so heavily upon mine heart, until purged in the consuming flames of the evil one. And it was the end of the first year of sin with men, and the end of mine sin before the Spirit." And now, in the mouth of the father of the house of Satan, do I offer up this prayer to mine heavenly father, writ upon the lightness of mine heart, destined to the blackness of sin, that it shall be washed away in the blood of the Lamb, as it gusheth from the body of thine slain enemy. And it is the end of the second year of sin with me, and the end of mine sin before thee. And likewise, in the water sepulchre of the Son of the house of the Antichrist, shall I mingle this prayer to the Son of God, writ upon the likeness of a dove, which arising from the cleansing water of baptism shall light upon me, bearing the forgiveness of Jesus, and it shall be the end of the third year of sin in me, and the end of mine sin before God 
the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The strange words of the note became shockingly clear when the full story finally unfolded. After hours of examination by Pinellas County Chief of Police George M. Koslick and Chief of Detectives John Trotter, Frank McDowell confessed that he shot his parents, but that it was done as an attempt to atone for having committed the unpardonable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit when he was about 10 or 11 years old. In addition, he admitted he had set the fire that killed his sisters the previous year. A third murder by drowning was planned for the following year. The sensational details of the story kept getting stranger and stranger. By his own admission, Frank declared he had been suffering from a form of insanity for several years. He wavered between fanatical religious beliefs and atheism. He was keenly intelligent and amiable most of the time, but would go off on wild tangents when discussing religion. While some acquaintances described Frank as intelligent, others saw him as dangerously cunning. He believed he had more intelligence and more importance than anyone else. He perceived himself as a person who deserved respect and privileges that he hadn't earned. His arrogant and wildly contradictory religious opinions caused him to gain a reputation that he was unbalanced. The trouble according to Frank, began around February 19, 1914. While playing with a young friend, he realized he had torn buttons off his shirt. In a fit of anger, he began cursing. The friend, Mary Birdsey, about 10 years old, overheard the blasphemous words which haunted the boy for years afterward. The revelation of the name of the playmate, who would now be grown, alarmed some experts who believed she was to be the next victim of the demented mind of Frank McDowell. Mary Lamar Birdsey was the only daughter of Albert H. Birdsey and Mary Anna Marshall. Like the McDowells, the Birdsey and Marshall families of North Carolina and Georgia were among the oldest in the South. At the time, of the McDowell scandal, Mary had not seen nor heard from Frank McDowell for over 16 years. In an interview with the Tampa Times on February 22, 1924, Frank remarked, quote, He planned to remove another person by death from his path. I am to kill my counterpart, a person who is my own age, someone for whom I have a great love, end quote. McDowell named Mary Birdsey as the person he loved more than anyone in the world, and she was destined to die by water on February 19, 1925. He continued, quote, She lives at Forsyth, Georgia. No, the town is not on the edge of the water, but there are several small bathing ponds in the town. I was planning to go back there this summer, end quote. This disturbing revelation came as quite a surprise to Miss Birdsey's mother. When approached by reporters, she said her daughter and McDowell had gone to kindergarten together, but they had had no contact since childhood. She was surprised that he even remembered her name. She refused to disclose where Miss Birdsey was attending college and made it clear she did not want her daughter's name associated in anyway, with the McDowell case. In the warped logic of Frank McDowell, the childhood incident barred his progress in becoming a sort of superman who was destined to rule a perfect world. It was his belief that only human sacrifice made by fire, blood, and water offered on the anniversary of the sacrilege could atone for that sin and set him back on the path of righteousness. During the times of haziness that came on prior to the fateful February date, Frank claimed to hear commands to destroy members of his family whom he believed were antichrists. 
He insisted he had no control over his actions committed during those episodes. On March 2, 1924, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reported the following quote from McDowell describing his haziness prior to the murders. Quote, I can't remember distinctly the ones I had before I killed my sisters, but I think it was much like the one I had which caused me to make preparations to kill my parents. It seemed to me that the Holy Ghost hovered over me, immense, terrible, and in the shape of a rabbit, a white rabbit. I remember only the white rabbit's command and its booming voice, Go kill the followers of the Antichrist. End of article. The revelation earned McDowell the moniker, quote unquote, the Holy Ghost Killer. Mental illness at that time was considered a shameful thing that needed to be hidden. Most families, particularly well to do families, either quietly took their afflicted loved one to a mental institute hid them in attics or locked them in rooms or basements. It didn't help that the treatment used in those institutions was often brutal and even inhumane. Newspaper reports claimed there had been previous signs of mental instability in the McDowell family. Frank's uncle, Eugene McDowell, committed suicide in 1915 by drinking carbolic acid after suffering financial reversals. His grandfather, William Pinckney McDowell, had fallen under a train, remarkably, on February 19, 1896, in Acworth, Georgia, and was crushed to death. It was unclear whether it was intentional or an accident. In one interview, Frank claimed he had once tried to commit suicide by stepping in front of a train. At some point, Frank discovered that taking certain drugs, such as morphine or other hypnotics, calmed his violent impulses. He learned how to forge prescriptions and was able to get the drugs, which he took in heavy doses. Theories about the motive for the murders were presented in newspapers nationwide. They ranged in the opinion that they had been calculated, premeditated murder, or that Frank was an egomaniac. One of the wildest theories claimed that he had been spooked by the voodoo tales of a quote-unquote old black mammy during his childhood, which left him deranged. The first trial, held in early June 1924, ended in a deadlocked jury. By the second trial, a few weeks later, Frank spent much of the time looking bored and uninterested. Evidence was shown that for an extremely brief time, he worked as an insurance agent and sold a double indemnity policy to his father, which upon the death of his mother left him the sole beneficiary. Testimony was given that on the very day of the shooting, he had taken a gun to target practice and had brought a large amount of morphine. As the second trial was about to wrap up, Frank kept insisting that he wanted to address the jury. Obviously, his attorney objected, but Frank was so insistent that the judge finally granted him the request. His testimony was a mixture of confession of guilt without personal responsibility for the crimes. Piecing it all together, the following disjointed picture emerges. Around the time Frank was about 10 or 11, he began having episodes of haziness and uncontrollable anger. The incident of the shirt missing buttons enraged him to the point of swearing, cursing, and blaspheming. Being raised in a respectable and very religious family, he probably felt empowered and horrified by the outburst which had been witnessed by his playmate. There was probably a lot more to the incident than will ever be known, but it made such an impression on Frank's mind that he fixated on it. 
At some point, he was present when a sermon on the unpardonable sin, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, was preached. He became convinced that he had committed that sin and was doomed for damnation. It was during these years that Frank began reading a lot of psychological and philosophical books, which he struggled to integrate with his religious upbringing. Whether he was truly mentally ill and to what degree cannot be known. It seems, according to all the evidence, he must have been. It is also apparent that he was addicted to strong hallucinogenic drugs. Regardless, he had the presence of mind by February 19, 1923, to dose his sisters into a deep sleep with the drugs. According to the bizarre heart letter, he may have thrust a cross-shaped note into Marion's womb and saturated the bed with gasoline or kerosene. Before locking the door from the outside, he threw burning coals from the fireplace into the room, setting it ablaze. This was the fire sacrifice. His parents were probably drugged as well, since they didn't wake up until the rafters had burned enough to come crashing down. According to his uncle P.C. Carnes, Frank's mother had suspected her son, but didn't want to lose him as well. That is why she refused to allow him to be questioned. After the family moved to Florida to try to start over, Frank's mother tried numerous ways to find work for her son, but he was either too spoiled to work or possibly unable to hold a job due to his mental state. Frank claimed he had little to do with the writing of the insurance policy. His father and Mr. Payne, his employer, wrote it up to help give him a start in the business. However, there were others who claimed Frank was greedy for money and wanted to move to New York with the insurance money. As the night of February 19, 1924 approached, Frank's feelings of unrest started up again. He later declared that he had no plans to do anything to his parents, but the white rabbit compelled him to act, and he had to obey. He took a heavy dose of morphine and probably drugged his parents and grandmother too. He claimed he had very little memory of what happened most of the night. There was evidence he left the house at some point and went to Mr. Payne's office, the insurance agent, and typed up the strange letter. There was a balled up piece of paper with a heart shape cut out found there. As the storm raged, he returned home, took the gun, and quickly shot his father twice in the left temple and then turned the gun on his mother, shooting twice. He said it happened so fast that neither parent ever stirred. This was the blood sacrifice. He quickly hid the gun in the bottom of a trunk, then went to sleep for a while. When he began to regain his senses, he awoke slit the screen on the door, and hit his head against a cabinet to appear as if someone had broken into the house and struck him. That was when he ran outside for help. Frank must have believed that because he had so easily escaped justice for the murders of his sisters, he had had no trouble getting away with this murder, too. After all, he still had one more sacrifice to offer the next year, the water sacrifice. It is unclear if he intended to drown in the baptismal waters or, more likely, drown Mary Birdsey, while he rose free from the bondage of his sin. He apparently didn't understand that without his mother's protection, he couldn't count on that. Frank had become something of a celebrity due to his good looks, youth, and the ghoulish nature of his crimes. Reporters visited his jail cell to get a first-hand scoop on what he had to say, and Frank enjoyed the notoriety. He related the gory details of the murders as if he had no personal part in the commission of them. Throngs of people clamored to get a spot in the courtroom to witness the proceedings. The Tampa Times reported, 
quote, Young girls crowded to the front of the courtroom in Clearwater yesterday, surrounding young McDowell on trial for the murder of his family. They perched in the windows and filled all other places of vantage. The judge was obliged to curb their enthusiasm and clear the front of the room, end quote. Testimony for the Defense by Dr. W. H. Spires, a staff physician at Chattahoochee Hospital, stated that because of his mental condition, Frank McDowell would live only five or six years longer, and the last years of his life, quote, his mind would be blank and he would have to be dressed and undressed, end quote. This testimony apparently moved the jury. Although they returned with a guilty verdict, mercy had been applied to his sentencing. To the chagrin of those who believed the young man was a cold-blooded murderer and should suffer the electric chair for his crimes, he was instead sentenced to life in prison. Taken to Rayford Prison Farm to begin his sentence, McDowell's stay was short. He attacked a prison guard and was sent to the state hospital in Chattahoochee. Once there, he was reported to be a model prisoner. As February 1925 neared, a few newspapers ran short articles noting McDowell's prophecy of his own death by water was approaching. When nothing happened, it seemed Frank's day in the spotlight had ended. Nevertheless, on November 19, 1925, his name was back in the Tampa Tribune when it was discovered he had been made a trustee at the asylum. The author of the article recalled at one point before leaving the Clearwater Jail, Frank had bragged he wouldn't stay at the prison farm for long. He planned to go to the state hospital where it would be easier to escape. The article goes on to say, quote, Wonder how long he will stay at the institution now that he has opportunity to escape, end quote. It didn't take long for the rebuttal from the superintendent of the Chattahoochee Hospital to be published. Quote, this statement is absolutely incorrect, erroneous, and without foundation. Frank McDowell is one of a small group of patients who are considered dangerous to be at large and are especially guarded by three men during the day and by three different men during the night who have no duties except to guard and care for this group of patients. End of article. The public was assured that McDowell posed no threat and no one should lose sleep over the matter. Five years passed without further news of the notorious Frank McDowell. According to the prognosis of Dr. Spires during McDowell's trial, his deterioration due to his mental disease should have left him in a vegetative state at this point. So, the next headline mentioning his name in the newspapers likely came as quite a surprise to those following his case. Quote, Youth who slew family flees asylum. End quote. On October 13, 1930, Frank McDowell and another inmate, John Pruitt, held a gun on a guard and forced him to unlock the doors. McDowell and Pruitt evaded capture for several days. Staff at the hospital scoffed at the idea that the men had an actual gun, they believed it was a toy. However, the guard that was involved insisted it was real. The alarm was sounded as the prisoners fled into swampland. Pruitt was quickly recaptured in North Florida. Tensions ran high in Florida and Georgia as the hunt for McDowell spread across the two states. On October 31, 1930, an unidentified man was found struck down by a hit-and-run driver on the coastal highway 20 miles south of Savannah, Georgia. He was taken unconscious to the hospital. He lingered in a coma for several weeks, dying on November 15, 1930. Representatives of the Chattahoochee Hospital arrived and identified the body as that of Frank McDowell. His body was taken to Ackworth, Georgia, and buried at Liberty Hill Cemetery, where his family 
including those he had murdered, were laid to rest. It may be speculated that Frank had returned to Georgia to find Mary Birdsey to complete his perverse mission. She was not there, however. On August 1, 1929, Mary Lamar Birdsey married John Collier Hogg, a Yale graduate in New York. They traveled the world for the first few years of the marriage. In July 1932, they welcomed a son and settled in a luxurious home on Shirley Avenue in Norfolk, Virginia. Something went terribly wrong. By 1934, the couple separated and later divorced. John C. Hogg moved with his son into his parents' home. At that time, the Birdseys had moved to Daytona Beach, Florida. In March 1939, the following notice appeared in the Florida Tallahatchie Herald, quote, Police here and in nearby cities pushed a search for Mrs. Mary Birdsey Hogg, 26, a mental patient who eluded her attendant here last Sunday afternoon and disappeared. Her well-to-do father, A. H. Birdsey, posted a reward of $100 at the police station for her safe return. Police held Walter Dobbins, the woman's attendant. The father said the young woman had disappeared from home twice before, but had been safely returned. He said she might try to make her way to Jacksonville, Ocala, or Orlando, that she had about a dollar and fifty cents when she left home. End quote. In a strange twist of fate, Mary Birdsey had suffered a mental breakdown, perhaps postpartum depression. When she was found, she was moved into a posh mental facility in Norfolk, Virginia, called the Westbrook Sanitarium, where she could receive better professional care. She was living there in 1940 and 1950, according to the U.S. federal census records. Her father passed away in 1940 and her mother in 1970. There is a third unmarked grave in Greenwood Cemetery located in Ocala, Marion County, Florida. It is possible that the third grave belonged to Mary, their only child, but the date of her death is unclear. The case of Frank McDowell was one of several sensationalized stories of murder at the hands of teenage boys that happened in the early part of the 20th century. The wave of horrific deeds performed by children left criminal authorities and health professionals scratching their heads over how to respond. Were these youngsters able to fully understand the significance of their actions? Should they be tried as adults? Was there any hope of rehabilitation for them? These are all questions that are still being debated today, and we are no closer to finding the answer. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fire, Blood, and Water, the Frank McDowell Story. Whether you are listening to this program as a podcast or watching via YouTube, please be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment. For more information on this and other podcasts of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem, please follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, where there are links to resources, photographs, and documents used to construct stories. For questions, comments, or suggestions for other historical subjects you'd like to hear, please email Mindy Hudson at M-E-L-I-N-D-A-M-A-L-O-O at gmail.com. Join us again next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.